From the Samsung Production Studios in the heart of Hazleton, Pennsylvania, it's your News 13. Brought to you by SSP TV and the Standard Speaker. It was a frightening scene. Local police, state police, officers with high-powered weapons surrounding a Hazleton neighborhood. The response to shots fired at police on Alter Street, our top story on News 13 for this Wednesday. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Kathy Bazinski. The Hazleton Police Department, state troopers, even the Secret Service members were all on the scene today at 4th and Alter Streets. But what really happened and how dangerous was it? Christina Papa was there and she has the rundown from law enforcement. Several departments were armed and ready to protect Wednesday afternoon. An unmarked police van's rear window exploded around noon today on 4th and Alter Street, right around the time police were holding a warrant sweep in that area. And in a matter of minutes, 30 police cars were on the scene investigating. For the next 45 minutes, police officers, law enforcement officers armed with assault weapons basically canvassed the neighborhood and went door to door conducted interviews and performed searches. Yellow police tape guarded the corners of the streets as neighbors watched on in suspense. Pistols, shotguns, they were, they were loaded. It was just a whole bunch of insanity. There was just so much emotional going on. A lot of things are just going on, at, uh, you know, all at the same time. The police were all over there and they were, uh, all had their guns drawn. It, it was bad. It was, uh, I mean, something you don't see in a community where you live and it's something you don't want to see. After reviewing the area, Police Chief Frank D'Andrea says armed forces didn't find any evidence of a gun. No weapons were found. No individuals with weapons were found. Uh, no recovered shell casings. None of the normal things that you would associate with that. Chief D'Andrea says he's sure the police van was shot at. It was shot with something. We're just not sure what kind of caliber, if it was perhaps even a BB from a passing motorist. Onlookers and the chief say they are proud of how quickly all of the officers came to the scene. I feel that they should be commended on the fact they had to stand out in the snow and deal with all this within just a couple days of other shootings. They deserve a lot of credit. The police officer that was in the van is not injured. Anyone with information is asked to call police. Christina Papa, News 13, Hazleton. An 18-year-old mentally disabled woman from West Hazleton told police she was raped on Monday night by several men. Now police are investigating what happened. Police say they have at least five suspects in this case and that the 18-year-old knew the suspect rapists and went to their house on Monday night. Investigators say the victim has the mental capacity of an 11-year-old and thought these people were trustworthy friends. Uh, physically, she's okay. Um, she had minor injuries. However, she does have the, uh, the mental capacity of approximately an 11-year-old. The, the people were older individuals. She has the mental uh, capacity of an 11-year-old. She was obviously very trusting of these people. Um, she, she thought that these were nice people, and, and obviously it, it turns out that that's not the case here. Chief Buglio says the case could lead to multiple arrests. So far, none of the suspects have been charged, but that could change. Governor Corbett has ordered that all Pennsylvania state flags be flown at half staff in honor of the corrections officer from Natticoke who was killed while on duty Monday night. 34-year-old Eric Williams was doing a head count in a housing facility at the federal prison at Canaan in Wayne County when he was attacked by an inmate who beat him and stabbed him several times with a homemade object. Williams wasn't armed. When he didn't leave the area after the count, another officer became suspicious and found him wounded. An autopsy showed Evans was killed by blunt trauma to the head and neck and multiple stab wounds. Evans' family has announced that a public viewing for the fallen correctional officer has been scheduled from 4 to 8 p.m. on Friday in the gymnasium of Greater Nanticoke Area High School. One of the toughest issues that the people and government of Luzerne County are facing is crime. At Tuesday night's State of the County session before Luzerne County Council, coping with prosecution and housing those convicted are the biggest challenges for the future. We need to have 40 stations on every shift, on the first and second shifts, in order to monitor the activities of 600 prisoners. Um, I think there's a better way to do that. Luzerne uh, County Manager Bob Lawton job. says there has to be a more efficient, less expensive way to run a prison. In his address to County Council, he said the existing prison doesn't work in this day and age without triple staffing and hemorrhaging taxpayer money. It's a five-story, 
tower prison surrounded by a building that dates back to the to the mid 1800s. It is inefficient. It is pre-modern in many ways, and does not allow us to minimize the cost of supervision of prisoners. Lawton says the $29 million it costs to run the current prison could be slashed if the county invested in an up-to-date one, which might even have a court facility attached, reducing personnel costs and time in shuttling for prosecutors. That is just one of the avenues that they had to take to cut back on their staff and make people less full-time, more part-time. And uh, it, it just is playing a, a, it just is a burden on all of us. First-term District Attorney Stephanie Salavantis told counsel while she's reorganized her office to make it more efficient, her team is just outnumbered by the volume of crime and cases flooding her office, especially with drug-related cases that jumped by several hundred in the past year. Council members say they get the problem, they just want to hear more solutions. I think one of the issues that we were looking to see and perhaps we're hoping to see more in the future is what are some of the solutions we're taking to really start solving a lot of these problems? Because we know the problems, the solutions are what elude us right now. Salavantis Mantis says she's trying everything to fight crime and help her staff deal with the caseload, including reaching out to the public. I'm trying to become more involved in the community, trying to reach out to crime watch groups, trying to just make people believe that I'm here and know that I'm here for them and anything that they need, our office is here and we will answer any questions and be and present to anybody that, that has any information or wants any information presented to them on the increase in crime and, and what to look for in their communities. Now, Salavanta said with the extent of crime, her office is like a triage unit, and she called Luzerne County a little Philadelphia in terms of the drug trade, heroin in particular. Well, crime doesn't have to happen face to face. It can happen online. As Stephanie Gorney tells us, a local school brought in an expert to teach kids how to deal with cyberbullying. Anybody in here think it's okay to type, text, or post mean and nasty things online? Does anybody really think that it's okay? <clears throat> then I ask you this question. Cyberbullying is becoming a larger issue with the way technology is constantly evolving. Holy Family Academy brought in Janine Holter with the Attorney General's Office to educate students on how to prevent this type of bullying. Some students, they don't know how to deal with when somebody else is posting negative comments about them, them or about another individual online. So we're trying to educate the students and give them the tools necessary because technology is wonderful, but we have to make sure that our students are knowing what to do if something happens online. Students are aware that bullying affects many individuals and that while they may only be a bystander, they still have to take action against this growing issue. It's really big. I mean, it, it, everybody just is so judgmental and it's just crazy, but it, you know, you have friends that you could look to and just help you and it's, it's, I don't have a problem with bullying, but I've seen people who are bullied and I try to help them and you know, that's that's the right thing to do. I learned a lot that you do need to play a role no matter what part, whether you're a bystander or you are the victim or the bully, you still need to report it to let someone know, otherwise bad things could happen. Although this presentation was specifically to bring awareness to cyberbullying, Holter also pointed out that students need to learn how to present themselves online. The things that students post could affect college and job opportunities down the road. Stephanie Gorney, News 13, Hazleton. And still ahead on News 13, it seems the sloppy weather has passed and we're in for a relative clear spell. We'll tell you all about it on News 13 weather. But first, if you can't find a job, you're probably having a tough time. But Friday's federal sequester could make things even worse. I'll tell you how when News 13 continues. Well, it was the fiscal cliff. Now it's the sequester, and it's supposed to take effect on Friday. We already know it will have a huge effect on anybody who gets help from a social service agency. And as Matthew Petrillo tells us, job assistance programs are also slated to take a hit. Those helping the unemployed might soon find themselves in their clients' own shoes. Recent figures released by the White House show a steep cut in job search assistance if the sequester happens. Pennsylvania will lose about $866,000 in funding. That will affect those who need job referrals and placements, like Colleen Gallagher, who was recently laid off. Rather a shock, rather devastating, something totally unexpected. Um, I was in the medical field, so one doesn't expect that in the medical field. So yeah, it was uh, kind of threw me for a loop. Gallagher isn't alone. If the sequester happens, more than 36,000 Pennsylvanians might not get the help and skills they need to find employment. They've very helpful in assisting all my needs with the computer, 
um, very helpful in helping me find different work occupations um, and, and the variety of jobs that are available out there. While state officials know how much funding they're set to lose in job assistance, many facilities like here in Hazleton are still bracing for the unknown, says Bob Pisco, program supervisor at the Luzerne County Career Link. I couldn't give you an actual uh, honest mm -hmm. comment on, on the sequestration because I honestly don't know how it would affect uh, any of our operations here. The sequester will make cuts across the board. So draconian, the cuts were supposed to have forced bipartisan talks. But those talks still haven't happened. The across-the-board cuts means all federally funded programs will take about the same hit at around 7 to 8 percent of their budgets. But while some programs do have fat to trim, Bob says others, like ready-to-work programs, are mostly as efficient as they can be. This office serves about 10,000 people in the county on a regular basis. Pishko says some people depend on it for job readiness. We do offer workshops for resumes, uh, interviewing workshops. We offer some credentialing programs here for nationally recognized credentials. And as the unemployment rate in Pennsylvania stands at almost 8%, Gallagher worries it could tick up if the cuts happen, making it more difficult for her to get a job. So she's looking for new options. Perhaps maybe re recreating myself. Mm -hmm. There are uh, many opportunities up here, which kind of surprised me. Bipartisan congressional leaders will meet with the president for talks Friday. The same day, the sequester goes into effect. Matthew Petrillo, News 13, Hazleton. Well, Can Do isn't commenting today, but it appears that plans for a Coca-Cola facility in the Humboldt Industrial Park are no longer a go, at least for now. Several years ago, the company purchased a large tract of land in the industrial park, at that time saying it was going to build a large beverage plant. Can Do now confirming that those plans are on hold and anything moving forward is up to Coca-Cola. Reports are that it's part of a worldwide freeze on Coca-Cola company expansion. And time now for our regional weather from the National Weather Service checking the radar. Fortunately, we can wave goodbye to all that precept that made things nasty through the overnight. Just a few trace showers through the evening tonight. Our creative condition tonight has a hint of spring. It's by Cassie Zeleznak, a second grader at West Hazleton Elementary Middle School, and she drew a bright sunny day with a rainbow, and she and her friend are walking their dogs, and there are some tulips, and that's a sure sign of spring. Now let's take a look at News 13 weather from the National Weather Service for Greater Hazleton tonight. Cloudy with scattered rain or snow showers, a low around 31 degrees. Then for Thursday, cloudy, occasional rain and snow showers again, with a high up to 36, the nighttime low of 25. Now heading to school. Schuylkill County tonight, cloudy with a chance of overnight rain or snow showers with a low around 31. And for Thursday, a chance of rain and snow showers, cloudy with a high near 41, nighttime low around 28 degrees. And let's check the winning midday lottery numbers. Good luck if you played. The daily number 930, Big 4, 3628, Quinto, 28767. And the treasure hunt for 17, 22, 28, and 30. Hope you won. Good evening, everyone, and here's tonight's Talk of the Town report. The Hazleton Health and Wellness Center will be hosting a family and friends CPR class Tuesday, March 5th from 6 to 8 p.m. The class will be held in the center's aerobic room. Cost is $10 per person. Free registration is required and space is limited. Call 570-454-2467 for additional information. And finally, the Hazleton Art League will be holding Women's Work, an exhibition of art created by women, from now until March 17th. Gallery is located at 225 East Broad Street in Hazleton, with hours Friday, Saturday, and Sunday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. For more info, please call 570-454-0092. At tonight's Talk of the Town. News 13 would like to send sincere condolences to the family and friends of these recently departed. Doris M. Kiltz, formerly of Lancaster, Private services will be held Monday at 11.30 a.m. at the Indian Town Gap National Cemetery. The Charles F. Snyder Jr. Funeral Home is handling the arrangements. Linda L. Laura of Zion Grove. Arrangements are incomplete and will be announced by the Stauffer Bresnick Funeral Home. Stephen Billock of Lake Hotto. Funeral is Monday at 9.30 a.m. from the Damiano Funeral Home. Friends may call Sunday from 6 to 8 p.m. Luis L. Semmer of Sugarloaf. The Harmon Funeral Home assisted the family with the arrangements. Beatrice D. DeLuca, formerly of Hazleton. Funeral is Friday at 9.30 a.m. from the Joseph A. Moran Funeral Home. Friends may call Friday from 8.30 to 9.30 a.m. And Michael A. Crawl of Whitehaven. Arrangements will be announced by the Lehman Family Funeral Service. Tonight's obituaries have been brought to you by the Smilax Floral Shop, located on 15th Street in Hazleton. Remember, palm crosses are now on sale. Call 570-454-0111. 
and by Mia's. Once again, the Hazleton area's number one rated restaurant. Call 570-501-3410 for information on lunch and packages. Hey guys, welcome to this week's District Newsmaker. We're at McAdoo Calaris with Mr. Gurkanen, a 7th and 8th grade science teacher, but also the Pennsylvania Junior Academy of Sciences sponsor. Is that right? That's correct. And we, you only have one student that signed up for it this year. Her name is Layla. Can you explain what is the Academy of Sciences? Uh, Pennsylvania Junior Academy of Science is a regional competition, schools from the Hazleton Area School District, Wilkes-Barre, Scranton, um, all within our region where students are asked to come up and create their own science experiment using the scientific method. So they come up with a problem, have a hypothesis, go ahead and uh, complete an experiment, and then explain the conclusions. Uh, we have a local, a regional competition rather, at King's College uh, this Saturday. Um, the students are from seventh through 12th grade. They report their conclusions, their experiments, their findings to a group of judges. And then um, we have a banquet at the after everyone has completed their uh, assignments. And then students are given first place, second place, and third place awards. The students who uh, finish in first place then go on to the state competition, which is out in State College. So it's nice for them because they get to spend two days on a college campus uh, to see what Penn State main campus is like. And then they present at a state level, and then again, they're awarded a first, a second, and third place um, after the state competition. Well, there's a lot of opportunity for the students, and I know only one of your students, Layla, was um, kind of took upon that opportunity and, and did a project. Can you explain a little bit about Layla's project? Um, yes, Layla is looking at uh, some an alternative energy source, um, something that uh, she came up with on things that she could do to replace the sources that we use now for energy. So uh, it's a, a very interesting project that she came up with and I uh, can't wait for her to present it and see how she winds up doing. Me too, thank you so much. Our actually, we're gonna go speak with Layla right now outside of the classroom and, and see what her perspective is on PJAS. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're going outside right now. Okay, now I'm outside of the classroom with Layla, the only Science Olympiad representative at McAdoo Calaris. Layla, what's your project? I built a test coil to find out if I can use it as an alternative energy source. So what does the Tesla coil look like? I know you have a couple of um, definitions and, and a hypothesis. Can you explain what it, the Tesla coil is? Um, it's basically just a large coil that exerts large amounts of electricity with a power source. So what was your hypothesis for this? Um, I thought that if I put a light bulb next to it, it was just going to light up. And did it do that? Yes, it did. Very cool. So you're going to be showing off your, your project on Saturday, is that right? I can't take it with me. I wish I could, but unfortunately I can't because it would be a hassle to take it on and off the bus. Okay, so you're going to be explaining it to the judges and then maybe getting an award? Yes, hopefully. hopefully. Right. Well, good luck with you. That's, that sounds like a really awesome project, and, and congratulations. That's this week's District Newsmaker. We'll see you guys next week. Sounded pretty exciting. Well, that plenty more news and information headed your way on News 13. More info on that frightening incident in a Hazleton neighborhood today. We'll tell you how it all played out. That story and much more news when the 13th crew comes right back. The future of the Schuylkill County landmark was in jeopardy when its main tenant closed up a while ago, but soon it'll be open for business again. The next chapter for the Tamaqua Station, our lead story on News 13 at 430. From the Samsung Production Studios in the heart of Hazleton, Pennsylvania, it's your News 13. Good evening and thanks so much for staying with us tonight. I'm Kathy Bazinski. The Tamaqua Station is a historical centerpiece for the community and it's getting a bit of a facelift. As Matthew Petrillo tells us, it's currently undergoing some delicious upgrades. The Tamaqua Railroad Station has a rich history not only important here, but to the entire Schuylkill neighboring counties. The first station served as a horse-drawn railroad. Then in 1833, it became the first commercial railroad to haul anthracite coal by steam engine and was also used as a passenger station. But after it seized operations in the 1960s, it became an eyesore, says Linda Yulanovich of the Tamaqua Area Chamber of Commerce. 
after the passenger station closed and after the, the railroad no longer used it as a station. It fell into disrepair. She says something needed to be done. There were some offers to demolish it, but one group wasn't going to let that happen. The Tamaqua Save Our Station group worked for more than 13 years to acquire the funding to repair the station. And while a restaurant soon opened, it closed after eight years this past December. The restaurant at the station closed its doors because it became too much work for its previous owners. But now with the economy slowly picking up speed, it's back in action and under new management. Now, new owners of a new restaurant say they'll have it operating sometime in early spring. Called Vaughn's Restaurant, it will feature American cuisine. Yulanovich says the opening will help put pride back into the community. You know, the restaurant's always been an important piece in there from the beginning of this passenger station. So I'm really, we're really happy to see it continue. And now it's become this beautiful piece of architecture once again in the center of town. Matthew Petrillo, News 13, Tamaqua. Well, Can Do is in commenting today, but it appears that plans for a Coca-Cola facility in the Humboldt Industria Park are no longer a go, at least for now. Several years ago, the company purchased a large tract of land in the industrial park, at that time saying it was going to build a large beverage plant. Can Do confirming today that those plans are now on hold and anything moving forward is up to the Coca-Cola company. Reports are that it's part of a worldwide freeze on Coca-Cola company expansion. Well, the Hazleton Police Department, state troopers, even the Secret Service were all on the scene today at 4th and Alter Street. But what really happened and how dangerous was it? Christina Papa was there and she has the rundown from law enforcement. Several departments were armed and ready to protect Wednesday afternoon. An unmarked police van's rear window exploded around noon today on 4th and Alter Street, right around the time police were holding a warrant sweep in that area. And in a matter of minutes, 30 police cars were on the scene investigating. For the next 45 minutes, police officers, law enforcement officers armed with assault weapons basically canvassed the neighborhood, went door to door, conducted interviews, and performed searches. Yellow police tape guarded the corners of the streets as neighbors watched on in suspense. Pistols, shotguns, they were... They were loaded. It was just a whole bunch of insanity. There was just so much emotional going on, and a lot of things are just going on, at, uh, you know, all at the same time. The police were all over there, and they were, uh, all had their guns drawn. It, it was bad. It was, uh, I mean, something you don't see in a community where you live, and it's something you don't want to see. After reviewing the area, Police Chief Frank DeAndrea says armed forces didn't find any evidence of a gun. No weapons were found, no individuals with weapons were found. Uh, no recovered shell casings, none of the normal things that you would associate with that. Chief DeAndrea says he's sure the police van was shot at. It was shot with something. We're just not sure what kind of caliber, if it was perhaps even a BB from a passing motorist. Onlookers and the chief say they are proud of how quickly all of the officers came to the scene. I feel that they should be commended on the fact they had to stand out in the snow and deal with all this within just a couple days of other shootings. They deserve a lot of credit. The police officer that was in the van is not injured. Anyone with information is asked to call police. Christina Papa, News 13, Hazleton. An 18-year-old mentally disabled woman from West Hazleton is telling police she was raped on Monday night by several men. Now investigators are trying to find out what happened. Police say they have at least five suspects in this case and that the 18-year-old knew the suspected rapist and went to their house on Monday night. Those investigators say the victim has the mental capacity of an 11-year-old and thought these people were trustworthy friends. Uh, physically, she's okay. Um, she had minor injuries. However, she does have the, uh, the mental capacity of approximately an 11-year-old. The, the people were older individuals. She has the mental uh, capacity of an 11-year-old. She was obviously very trusting of these people. Um, she, she thought that these were nice people, and, and obviously it, it turns out that that's not the case here. And Chief Buglio says the case could lead to multiple arrests. So far, none of the suspects have been charged, but that could change. One of the toughest issues that the people and government of Luzerne County are facing is crime. Tuesday night stayed at the county session before Luzerne County Council. They talked about coping with prosecution and housing those convicted, saying they're the biggest challenges for the future. We need to have 40 stations on every shift, on the first and second shifts, in order to monitor the activities of 600 prisoners 
Um, I think there's a better way to do that. Luzerne uh, County Manager Bob Lawton job. says there has to be a more efficient, less expensive way to run a prison. In his address to County Council, he said the existing prison doesn't work in this day and age without triple staffing and hemorrhaging taxpayer money. It's a five-story tower prison surrounded by a building that dates back to the, to the mid-1800s. It is inefficient. It is pre-modern in many ways and does not allow us to minimize the cost of supervision of prisoners. Lawton says the $29 million it costs to run the current prison could be slashed if the county invested in an up-to-date one, which might even have a court facility attached, reducing personnel costs and time in shuttling for prosecutors. That is just one of the avenues that they had to take to cut back on their staff and make people less full-time, more part-time. And uh, it, it just is playing a, a it, it just is a burden on all of us. First term district attorney Stephanie Salavantis told council while she's reorganized her office to make it more efficient, her team is just outnumbered by the volume of crime and cases flooding her office, especially with drug related cases that jumped by several hundred in the past year. Council members say they get the problem, they just want to hear more solutions. I think one of the issues that we were looking to see and perhaps we're hoping to see more in the future is what are some of the solutions we're taking to really start solving a lot of these problems? Because we know the problems, the solutions are what elude us right now. Salavantis Mantis says she's trying everything to fight crime and help her staff deal with the caseload, including reaching out to the public. I'm trying to become more involved in the community, trying to reach out to crime watch groups, trying to just make people believe that I'm here and know that I'm here for them and anything that they need, our office is here and we will answer any questions and be and present to anybody that, that has any information or wants any information presented to them on the increase in crime and, and what to look for in their communities. And Salavantis said that compared to the extent of crime, her office is like a triage unit and called Luzerne County a little Philadelphia in terms of the drug trade in heroin in particular. Well, Governor Corbett has ordered that all Pennsylvania state flags be flown at half staff in honor of the corrections officer from Nanticoke who was killed while on duty Monday night. 34-year-old Eric Williams was doing a head count in a housing facility at the federal prison at Canaan in Wayne County when he was attacked by an inmate who beat him and stabbed him several times with a homemade object. Williams wasn't armed. When he didn't leave the area after the count, another officer got suspicious and found him wounded. An autopsy showed Evans was killed by blunt trauma to the head and neck and multiple stab wounds. Evans' family has announced that a public viewing for the fallen corrections officer has been scheduled from 4 till 8 p.m. this Friday in the gym at Greater Nanticoke Area High School. Well, crime doesn't have to happen face to face. It can happen online. As Stephanie Gorney tells us, a local school brought in an expert to teach kids how to deal with cyberbullying. Anybody in here think it's okay to type text or post mean and nasty things online? Does anybody really think that it's okay? Then I ask you this question, why is it happening? Cyberbullying is becoming a larger issue with the way technology is constantly evolving. Holy Family Academy brought in Janine Holter with the Attorney General's Office to educate students on how to prevent this type of bullying. Some students, they don't know how to deal with when somebody else is posting negative comments about them, them or about another individual online. So we're trying to educate the students and give them the tools necessary because technology is wonderful, but we have to make sure that our students are knowing what to do if something happens online. Students are aware that bullying affects many individuals and that while they may only be a bystander, they still have to take action against this growing issue. It's really big. I mean, it, it, everybody just is so judgmental and it's just crazy, but it, you know, you have friends that you could look to and just help you. And it's, it's, I don't have a problem with bullying, but I've seen people who are bullied and I try to help them. And you know, that's, that's the right thing to do. I learned a lot that you do need to play a role no matter what part whether you're a bystander or you are the victim or the bully, you still need to report it to let someone know, otherwise bad things could happen. Although this presentation was specifically to bring awareness to cyberbullying, Holter also pointed out that students need to learn how to present themselves online. The things that students post could affect college and job opportunities down the road. Stephanie Gorney, News 13, Hazleton. And coming up on News 13, a break from the bad roads and nasty weather. We'll tell you all about it in News 13 weather. And what will the upcoming federal sequester of the budget mean to folks who have lost their jobs and need some help finding a new one? We'll have the impact just ahead on News 13. 
Well, it was the fiscal cliff. Now it's the sequester, and it's supposed to take effect on Friday. We already know it will have a huge effect on anybody who gets help from a social service agency. But as Matthew Petrillo tells us, job assistance programs are also slated to take a hit. Those helping the unemployed might soon find themselves in their clients' own shoes. Recent figures released by the White House show a steep cut in job search assistance if the sequester happens. Pennsylvania will lose about $866,000 in funding. That will affect those who need job referrals and placements, like Colleen Gallagher, who was recently laid off. Rather a shock, rather devastating, something totally unexpected. Um, I was in the medical field, so... One doesn't expect that in the medical field. So, yeah, it was uh, kind of threw me for a loop. Gallagher isn't alone. If the sequester happens, more than 36,000 Pennsylvanians might not get the help and skills they need to find employment. They're very helpful in assisting all my needs with the computer, um, very helpful in helping me find different work occupations. Um, and, and the variety of jobs that are available out there. While state officials know how much funding they're set to lose in job assistance, many facilities like here in Hazleton are still bracing for the unknown, says Bob Pisco, program supervisor at the Luzerne County Career Link. I couldn't give you an actual uh, honest mm -hmm. comment on, on the sequestration because I honestly don't know how it would affect uh, any of our operations here. The sequester will make cuts across the board. So draconian, the cuts were supposed to have forced bipartisan talks. But those talks still haven't happened. The across-the-board cuts means all federally funded programs will take about the same hit at around 7 to 8 percent of their budgets. But while some programs do have fat to trim, Bob says others, like ready-to-work programs, are mostly as efficient as they could be. This office serves about 10,000 people in the county on a regular basis. Pishko says some people depend on it for job readiness. We do offer workshops for resumes, uh, interviewing workshops. We offer some credentialing programs here for nationally recognized credentials. And as the unemployment rate in Pennsylvania stands at almost 8%, Gallagher worries it could tick up if the cuts happen, making it more difficult for her to get a job. So she's looking for new options. Perhaps maybe re recreating myself. Mm -hmm. There are... Uh, many opportunities up here, which kind of surprised me. Bipartisan congressional leaders will meet with the president for talks Friday, the same day the sequester goes into effect. Matthew Petrillo, News 13, Hazleton. And time now for our regional weather from the National Weather Service. Checking out the radar. Fortunately, say goodbye to all the precip that made things so nasty last evening and through the overnight. Just a few trace showers through tonight. Our creative condition, a hint of spring. It's by Cassie Zaleznock, a second grader at West Hazleton Elementary Middle School. She drew a bright sunny day with a rainbow. She and her friend are walking their dogs. And over in the corner, there are some tulips, which we know are a sure sign of spring. Now let's take a look at News 13 weather from the National Weather Service for Greater Hazleton. Tonight, it'll be cloudy with scattered rain or snow showers, a low around 31. Then for Thursday, cloudy with occasional rain or snow showers, a high up to 36, nighttime low of 25. For Friday, partly sunny with a high near 36, a slight chance of snow showers at night, low down to 20. Saturday, mostly sunny, a high around 30, low of 16. And Sunday, mostly cloudy with a high around 27 degrees. On to Schuylkill County, tonight cloudy with a chance of overnight rain or snow showers with a low around 31. And for tomorrow, chance of rain and snow showers, cloudy, high all the way up to about 41 degrees, nighttime low down to 28. For Friday, mostly cloudy with a high near 39, the low of 24. Saturday, partly sunny, a high near 36, low down to 21. And Sunday, a little bit colder, mostly cloudy with a high of about 30 degrees. And still ahead on News 13, last night's foul weather means plenty playoff plans were scrubbed. Fred Barletta with all the rescheduled basketball action on News 13 Sports. Keep it right here. SSP TV Sports on News 13 with Fred Barletta Jr. Well, we're going to try it again. Last night, a lot of the games postponed because of the uh, freezing drizzle and rain. Now, there were some games that were played down in the Wyoming Valley. They didn't get all of this frozen precipitation, so we'll tell you more about that. But let's go back to where we were exactly 24 hours ago and set it all up again. We'll start with the girls, Quad A, because that's where you're going to find the Hazleton area Lady Cougars. And uh, they're in the semifinals tonight. Now, they haven't played in nearly two weeks, but uh, we'll see if they can shake the rust off. And they'll go after their old nemesis, the girls from Wyoming Valley West. Of course, the two teams have met twice this year. Valley West won both of them 
So we go to that old adage, is it that difficult to beat a team three straight times? Joe Gavio and his gang are going to try to prove that is the case, and they're going to try to uh, advance, go into that district final. Now, they'll be playing the winner of Scranton, Wallen, Pulpak. Wallen, Pulpak, the number one seed. So there you got it. The four teams by the end of tonight will be down to just two. That's the uh, girls' quad A. Same thing for boys' single A, because that's where the MMI preppers have to put it on hold before they take on top-ranked Susquehanna. Susquehanna MMI. Now, this game is going to be played at Scranton High School. Yesterday, it was going to be played at Lackawanna College. So uh, now, the venues changed to Scranton High School. Other half of the bracket, it's Forest City and Old Forge. They're playing first game of a doubleheader at Lackawanna. And again, same thing as the girls. We'll go from four to two by the end of tonight. Now, what else is going on? Let's go back to boys' quad A. Hazleton is not in but it's going to be Scranton and Williamsport. That game is going to be played at Berwick tonight. So we'll see what happens. Of course, Scranton, the team to knock out the Cougars on Saturday. We almost had a major upset last night in District 2, but we said almost it didn't happen. Abington Heights, the top-ranked team, they got put to the test. Double overtime, as a matter of fact, but Abington Heights prevailed. They held on and they defeated Scranton Prep. 71 to 70, so, uh, well, as we said, it's uh, pretty close, but Abington Heights prevails. Meanwhile, what you got on the other half of the bracket, it's going to be uh, GAR that's going to play Abington Heights. They rolled over Crestwood last night by the score of 40 to 29. Bethlehem Catholic, they knocked out uh, Pottsville last night. Pottsville was the number one seed, and here we go once again. I know it might not be what it used to be, but you have a team that was very middle of the road in the Lehigh Valley, and uh, they knock off Pottsville, the number one seed in the Schofield League. They'll be playing Allentown Central Catholic. The uh, Vikings took out Salisbury last night, so it's ACC and Bethlehem Catholic squaring off on that uh, AAA level. You got Catasauqua at Williams Valley tonight, Notre Dame at Green Pond at North Schuylkill. That's the uh, double A, and in single A, Lincoln Leadership Academy plays Pius X, and we already know who they're going to play. The rubber match goes to Mahanoy area. They take out Marion last night, 44-37 the final there. So uh, Mahanoy area, we'll wait and see who survives out of that uh, game tonight. As far as the girls, in the uh, triple A, Southern Lehigh will uh, battle North Schuylkill tonight. That'll be at Allen High School. And Allentown Central Catholic and Bethlehem Catholic, they'll play at Parkland. We go down to Double A. It's going to be Pine Grove and Notre Dame of East uh, of Green Pond. And in the single A, Shenandoah and Tri Valley, Notre Dame and Marion. That's a double dip that'll be taking place at Marts Hall tonight, starting at six o'clock. Middle of the week, and you know what that means at Bottlenecks, it's Steak and Ale Night. You can choose from a variety of their specialty hand-cut steaks, and it's served with unlimited salad and fries for just $9.95. You can't go wrong. Great beer specials all night long as well. Don't forget, kitchen open midnight seven days a week, and they got those 14 flat-screen TVs. A lot of good fun up at Bottlenecks. And that's News 13 for your Wednesday. Thank you so much for joining us. You can catch this newscast again with rebroadcast throughout tonight or just go to News 13's website any old time, ssptv.com, where you'll always find the local and regional news you need and the community news you want. For the entire News 13 team, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Kathy Vizinski. Have a great night.